Oh, phew, we were not that team. Why Detroit and what they're going through is absolutely terrifying because I'm not sure they've done anything wrong. And there's something going on in the NBA. We'll look at that as well. It's an offensive explosion. It's next on Locked on Jazz. Bum 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 pow. You are Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hi, how are you? I'm David Locke, radio voice for Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider coming to you from the Maybe the best city in all of North America, uh, Toronto, Canada. Absolutely fabulous. It doesn't look like that outside. If you're watching on YouTube in the background, that's it's gray and cold, but that's what it looks like in the summer. I can't wait to come visit here um, sometime in the summer. Uh, on today's show, Locked on Jazz, by the way, is your daily podcast in Utah Jazz. We will talk about last night's win and the versatility of Kelly Olynyk and what a marvelous player he is and how the Jazz, oh, few got that win last night was the best way to sum it up. Uh, I want to take a look at Cleveland and Detroit in both their rebuilds. And Detroit's is terrifying because they've lost 25 straight games. And I'm not sure they've done anything really wrong. Maybe one that would have changed everything. But one thing really wrong in the process. Ah, totally terrifying. Um, There is a massive offensive explosion going on in the NBA. I'll try to explain that to you. And we will look at points gained. I was looking at points gained going, what is going on? And that led me to do some other research, and that's how I discovered there's an offensive explosion that's actually, like, so significant that it actually changes the landscape of the NBA. How's that? Uh, I'm David Locke, radio voice of the Utah Jazz, Jazz NBA insider, and this is Locked on Jazz. It's your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz, giving you insight, expertise, geeky numbers, and hopefully making it way better to be a Jazz fan each and every day. Thank you so much for making Locked on Jazz your first listen, and thank you so much for the everydayers out there who join us each and every day. We are free and available on all podcasting apps and on YouTube. All right, I think other than uh, postcast tomorrow, this will be our final show before Christmas. I was debating whether I might do like a Q&A tomorrow because um, I didn't do a show yesterday. Uh, my voice got tired and I just got nervous on a back-to-back. We were playing a lot of games in a lot of cities. We've been on the road a lot and my voice was just tired. And so I thought I would take the morning off yesterday to make sure I could do what's the most important thing, which is call games. Um, So I apologize for that. Um, But I I felt good last night, so I felt good to go today. Um, Maybe I'll do something tomorrow. Um, We're in Toronto and uh, get you guys just a holiday that kind of sits kind of an evergreen piece that sits out for the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th. So if you want to get away from the family or whatever. But uh, happy holidays. Merry Christmas. Um, thank you guys all for being a part of us, uh, this show and, and locked on. And uh, I just feel really tied to this community. Uh, we've been doing this together for a long time. You've been with me for a long time. Uh, your uh, support has allowed me to build locked on. Uh, your support has allowed me to try things and fail. And I'm just super appreciative of that. So uh, thank you. And your Jazz Nation, um, uh, your Jazz Nation passion is um, awesome and drives me and is quite a burden to to live up to all the time. I, I will tell you, like on nights like yesterday where I was a little nervous about my voice, the stress and pressure of like, oh, gosh, I got to be able to perform for everyone tonight. They they care. They care. Um, but it came together. So it was great. Uh, that was a it's a weird one to talk about. So that was a good win. Uh, you're missing that many guys. You're on the road. You're on a back to back. The world had conspired against you to be the team. And you weren't. Um, and that's great because uh, we didn't we didn't need to be the team. Um, and we could have justified it and we could have looked at it and everything like that, but we didn't need to be the team that lost to the finally lost to the Detroit Pistons. We don't need to be the team when they come in January either. Um, and it's, it was, uh, I shared this on postcast last night. Like it was tense around the team. It was pensive. Uh, the plane leaving Cleveland to Detroit was as kind of quiet. And as I've heard felt in a long time, Sometimes you get on the plane, you get, you kind of read the plane, and you're like, all right, everyone's tense, just be really quiet, get to your seat, head down. Like, that was that was my feeling on that day. There's other days where you win, everyone's jovial. There's other days where it's like you lose, but it's a good loss, and and everyone's like, not fine, but they're, but no, one, no one's going to, like, you felt like you were on eggshells a little bit. Like, oh, God. There, that was the first time, and the first time, really, I felt that um, 
Will's incredibly amazing at keeping a positive, uplifting uh, environment on this team. And Will has even said recently, like, I want to win every single game, but the key is to keep perspective of where we're going and have a conviction to where we're going and what we're doing and trying to take the steps forward to have that conviction. And, you know, in the moment of a game, I have no perspective, he says. And I want to win every single time, just like you, just like the fans. He doesn't say just like the fans, but I'm adding that. And it's afterwards you have to say, okay, well, what are we doing? What's our perspective and where are we? And we, in, in that sense, like it wouldn't have been catastrophic or anything, but we just didn't need that loss. Like you're, things are really moving forward, maybe small steps at a time. This team's playing with much better intention. It's playing much better basketball. Um, it's playing with, with a little more oomph to the way, to its, to its game. It's playing the way it sh- they should be playing. The ball's moving beautifully. Um, guys are getting stretched differently at different times and stepping up to it. Um, Simone last night, I thought, and Ochai both understood, like they let it rip a little bit and they were, you know, that's giving a little actually in, in Kelly, you know, Kelly has a criticism. He doesn't shoot enough because sometimes I think Kelly only takes a shot if he's open to keep his shooting, you know, cause like he just wants to make sure he's perfect all the time. Um, not to keep his shooting percentage up because he wants to be perfect all the time. That's Kelly's kind of, he wants to be perfect. He wants everything to be elegant and everything to be perfect. And everything to be a masterpiece. And um, last night, Kelly just played. He was fabulous. And I think this is just such a tribute to Kelly Olenek on how much this guy has altered his game depending on who he's played for and what he does. I, there are not many players who are as much of a chameleon in a 10-year career. And we talked to Kelly about this early in the year, but like in Boston for his opening four years, he has kind of one role. And then he goes to Miami and he has kind of a different role. He actually starts a bunch of Miami. Then he goes to Houston for 27 games. and He's their number one option and turns around and averages 19 points a game. Then he goes to Detroit where it was kind of a mess for 40 games and he's supposed to be really important and he doesn't get played a lot and then he gets hurt. He comes to us and he has just bounced in between all of those roles on a given night. Like, I mean, this year he's only averaging eight points a game. It's the lowest average he's ever had in his career of, of averaging in points, but he's averaging 4.4 assists, which is his highest of all time because we don't have any point guards or natural point guards. And so he suddenly changed his game entirely. Yet last night, when suddenly we needed him to go score because Lowry's not on the floor, boom. I mean, it would be fascinating to look up. There used to be a way to do this, and the NBA's gotten rid of it, so it's harder now. Um, what his usage rate is when Kelly's when Lowry's not on the floor. I mean, his understanding of the game and how to play. I, I've been on this kind of quest for the last little while. Kelly enjoys playing in the NBA as much as any player I've ever been around. And I've been trying to figure out why. I, I actually think it's a... Like from a franchise standpoint, he's certainly not, he's 30 years old. He's certainly not a piece, 32 years old. He's certainly not a piece of our championship team. You know, we're not three years away from winning a championship. Um, but he he is culturally, to me, a, a really unique piece. And I do wonder if you just bypass the second round draft pick or whatever you're going to get for Kelly, because he enjoys himself so much, has loves the game so much that it rubs off on everyone else around there. This job, they get paid huge amounts of money, but it's kind of a weird job. And it usually breaks. We saw with Donovan, it breaks players and makes it so that they don't have a love and zest for it the way they once did. And it becomes a job. That's the reality. Kelly still loves it the way he would as a child. Um, and I've talked to Kelly about it. He just loves the game. It was his place. It was what his family did. His dad was a coach. His mom was a ref. I've talked to Will about it. And he's like, he just is who he is. And he just loves to compete. He'll play one-on-one. He'll play two-on-two. He'll play three-on-three. He'll just play all the time. And in that sense, he's just a hooper. But that ability to just be a hooper who's going to play one-on-one, two-on-two, or three-on-three is also the same thing that is allowing him on a given night to change his game depending what the game means. Right? Like, he loves to play one-on-one. Well, we saw a lot of one-on-one last night. Like, when they stretched it out, Kelly went and did his weird, bizarre, not-off-the-ground footwork, pump fakes, step through, off-balance, dive my shoulder into you, whatever it might be, kind of shots that make Kelly... Like, but he but he makes them. He knows what he's doing. And that's from just playing one-on-one, one-on-playing, playing, playing, playing all the time and loving the game. 
Um, and and that's also his just mood and atmosphere. And he's he's prominent in shoot arounds. He makes he asks questions. He he does things. Um, you know, he's not a good defense player. The open of the game was a disaster with he and John Collins. Oh my gosh, I kind of lost it on the air. Um, we eight of their first ten shots last night were at the rim, and they were like dunks or layups. I I I, I didn't kind of lose it last night. I was like, this is hideous defense. Um, it was kind of bizarre that we could be that bad to start a night. Um, but that's that's what we were. And then Walker came in the game and and changed things. Kelly, and this is where, you know, this kind of goes back to the comment. They were nine of ten to open the night last night. Um, this is the kind of the comment you can get from that Will Hardy makes that I love, which is okay. We can sit around and talk about all the things Kelly's not good at, but his superpowers are real. And let's talk about the things he is good at. And he's just a fabulous teammate. And he moves the ball. And he's always interested in doing what's best for his teammates. And last night, he realized what was best for his teammates was take 16 shots. And Kelly's not someone who takes 16 shots very often. And I actually think Kelly's almost uncomfortable taking 16 shots. At the same time, I would go back to this. I will never forget this. This was one of the most interesting conversations I had with Kelly. We got to Houston last year. And I was like, oh, what was this like? Thinking I was going to get this story from him that it was, you know, kind of a disaster. He's like, oh, it's the most fun I've ever had in my career. I'm like, yeah, you won like one game. He's like, yeah, I found out all the things I could do. Like, I got to spread my wings and find out all the things I could do. He scored 19 points a game. These guys love to, these guys who love to play, they, you know, they do like to win, but there is a level where you also are kind of like, hey, wait a sec. Like, I want to prove how good I am. So for Kelly last night, where he hadn't taken more than nine shots in any game all year, he took 16. He took 16. That's the most he's ever taken as a jazz player. He did it once last year against Memphis when he had 28 points 14 rebounds and six assists and a loss. I'm going to guess everybody was out and right before or after all-star break and Kelly needed to make us like step up. Like that's what he does. Uh, so pretty awesome by Kelly. Um, all right. I, I want to talk about what we saw to Cleveland and Detroit. I really want to talk about Detroit because I dug into how they got where they are right now. I I'm terrified by Detroit. I, I'm not sure they've done that many things wrong. Like that's terrifying. We'll talk about it. There, there's one part of their rebuild that's just majorly different than ours, thank goodness. But that's the pit that they're in right now doesn't feel like it's that hard to get into. We're just getting started, so stay with us here on Locked on Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Today's show is brought to you by our good friends over at Murdoch Hyundai, located at 4646 South State Street, also located in Logan. And in Linden, the Murdochs have been in Utah for over 80 years, and that's what makes them pretty awesome because I remember very, you know, I, I met Blake and and Ben and have gotten to be friends with Blake, I would say, at this point, uh, what, seven years ago now when they started sponsoring on Lockdown and uh, maybe more. Well, we might be up to eight or nine years. And, you know, they, they we've been together for this whole, whole ride. One of the things that jumped out to me was how much the family, because I, I met all the older the, the fathers and the grandfathers, the pride they took in just making sure that the Utah had this like great experience every single time they went to Murdoch. And then that showed during COVID when everybody else was supply chains were off and everybody else was jacking prices up $5,000. And Blake's like, I am not going to do that. I'm not going to the grocery store or going to church and having it that I charge somebody more. Like, I'm just not going to have that experience. Um, so they're just truly members of our community. And that's what uh, is the signature, the customer service you get whenever you're at Murdoch. And then the Hyundai car, it's just fabulous. Uh, I've bought three of them, so I'm not making stuff up. So if you're going to stop by Murdoch Hyundai, go to Linden or Logan or at 4646 South State Street. Please email me first at dlock09 at gmail.com and let me get you your VIP experience. Today's show is also brought to you by eBay Motors, and it's time for your eBay Motors guaranteed fit with Josh Lloyd, the Lockdown Fantasy Basketball host, who is the number one fantasy basketball host in the world. It's your eBay's guaranteed fit fantasy pick of the week. Five guys. For him to take a look at uh, Brendan Podolinski out of Golden State, who has looked comfortable as a starter, widely available in most fantasy leagues, contributes across the board. Tari Eason is coming off the bench in Houston, getting lots of minutes. He's a strong fantasy value per minute option who becomes useful to everyone as these minutes pick up. Grayson Allen is getting extended time in Phoenix with Bradley Beal out. James Wiseman did not look good last night, so I don't know about that, but he is was mentioned. And Malachi Branham is now starting 
in San Antonio, who we'll see on the 26th. He's a good little point guard. That's all from Josh Lloyd, Locked On Fantasy Basketball, helping you win your championship. And eBay Motors knows what a championship looks like. It has to have the perfect fit, which is same with your vehicle. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make your ride stay running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof racks, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride for the time, every time, your money back or your money back. Plus, these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. It's eBay Motors. Enjoy your ride or die. eBay Motors, ebaymotors.com, eBay Motors, guaranteed fit only. Available customers in the U.S. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. Thank you very much for making Locked On Jazz your first listen of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Appreciate it greatly. Um, Locked On NBA comes to you every single day. 30 minutes recapping the whole night in sports. Like on a night like yesterday where we play early and then um, and fly and then I miss kind of the games. I'll watch rewatch some today. Uh, I definitely use Locked On NBA as my recap of the night. It's pretty awesome. All right. Let's talk about Detroit for a second. Well, Let's first talk about Cleveland, because I think Cleveland's really interesting. This is actually, like, perilously how hard the rebuild is for the Jazz. So Cleveland's done, just quickly, really, really quickly. Cleveland got bad, and then they drafted Colin Sexton in their first draft of the rebuild. And then they, in their second, they drafted Darius Garland. And then their third, they drafted Evan, they they. They went 19 and 63, 19 and 46, 22 and 50. So they had three years after LeBron left and they lost in the finals. Um, the first one, they out of the 18 19 draft, they get Colin. Out of the 20 draft, they get Darius Garland. And out of the 21 draft, they get Evan Mobley. Um, and then they, they scoop in and get Jared Allen on kind of the back end of a big, I think it was a James Harden deal, really, really nicely. And he becomes kind of their best player. And then they. In 21-22, they have this really good year with all those guys. Like, Garland steps forward and becomes a star. And Mobley is showing signs, which he's slowed down doing in his in his rookie year. And Jared Allen, and they have Karis LeVert and Lowry Marketing, and they've got this kind of good group. And then they parlay Colin Sexton, that early draft pick, and Lowry Marketing and Donovan Mitchell. And they accelerate the path a little bit, and they win 51 games. It's kind of exactly how you – that's, like, pretty – well done, and it was three years of pain. Um, and they hit on they also drafted Isaac Okoro in that window, and that might be a miss, but that's kind of what the draft yielded. Um, so you know, Colin and Isaac Okoro weren't long term pieces, Darius Garland, Evan Mobley were they went two for four in the draft, and they moved forward, okay, and they then put all the chips in. And now we'll see because the problem is they suddenly got struck by injuries this year, and Donovan is mumbling about getting out and everyone in the world thinks Donovan's leaving like it is there's no question in anyone's mind that Donovan's leaving Cleveland which is great for us with our draft picks all right let's look at Detroit they're awful I mean they're about to set the record for the worst losing streak of all time they've only been in double digits 10 times I talked about all last night they they've only led in the fourth quarter five times in in 25 games they've only led in the final two minutes once they've only they haven't in the last nine eight games nine games they have not been with lead in the fourth quarter after the 950 mark. Like it's a disaster. They're two and twenty-six. And they're in year five. They went twenty and forty-six. They went twenty and fifty-two. They went twenty-three and fifty-nine. They're seventeen and sixty-five. They're in year five of this. In eighteen nineteen, they're forty-one and forty-one, and they realize they don't have it. That Stan Van Gundy has spent Four years there trying to make them good, and they, it turned out it didn't work. They had Tobias Harris and Andre Drummond and Blake Griffin. And they get nothing for their guys. So they literally start this rebuild from the bottom with nothing. Blake Griffin yields them nothing. Andre Drummond yields them nothing. Tobias Harris yields them basically nothing. And that's the think that's the difference. Oklahoma City, Utah have done this with these trades that get them Larry Markin and Shea Gilgis Alexander, not the same player um, or level player, but you get the concept and that gives them some level of semblance and then a bunch of other picks 
from Rudy Gobert, Donovan Mitchell, from James Harden, from Russell Westbrook, from Kevin Durant, like whatever it might be. Um, and they didn't. Paul George is not Kevin Durant. Um, but they didn't get anything. But if you go look at their so in 1920, they go 20 and 46. So they draft the seventh pick of the draft and they draft Killian Hayes with the seventh pick, which is turned out to be a really bad pick. But the next guys were Obi Toppum, Denny Avida, and Jalen Smith. Like, Jalen Smith isn't even on his original team. Denny Avida's fine. Obi Toppin's not even on his original team. Yeah, Tyrese Halliburton was the 12th pick of the draft. They should have done that. But we can do this kind of in every draft. So you've got to be a little careful. But obviously, that would have changed everything if they had drafted Tyrese Halliburton. They they'd make a, they have Luke Kennard on the roster. They do a nice job and trade him for Sadiq Bey in a draft. And Sadiq Bey turns out to be pretty good. They then move on from him. But so they do that kind of, I mean, Killian Hayes turns out to be wrong, but like, I'm not sure that that draft actually yielded them anything that would have been good. In the 2021 draft, they go 20 and 20, they go 20 for two, they get the number one pick, they get Cade Cunningham. Okay. Like, again, Cade's pretty good. Nobody was quibbling about him being the number one pick. There was a little, I mean, actually, that's not entirely true. There was a little quibbling about Cade Cunningham being the number one pick. He's not that explosive, but he's good. Like, I think it would be a little retrospectively questioning to say, well, I knew you should have taken somebody else. Um, Cade, you know, I think everybody kind of universally was the college player of the year. He was or close to it. He was totally dominant in college. And frankly, the next guys taken were Jalen Green, Evan Mobley and Scotty Barnes and Jalen sucks. Like, eh, I wouldn't take any of those over Cade Cunningham right now. I mean, Evan Mobley was the other guy you could have drafted. Number one, I think he's been underwhelming recently. So here they get the number one pick, and I might argue that they just got a, a draft that didn't have a great number one pick. And then 21-22, they go 23-59, and 59 and they draft Jaden Ivey, who I'm a big fan of, but I'm not sure how he fits. And you've already drafted Killian Hayes. So, like, there's a really good question of, like, well, why did you do that? So maybe that's their big mistake. Well, I don't think so. Like, I like Jaden Ivey. I think he could be really good, and... The guys that went after him were Benedict Matherin, Shaden Sharp, Dyson Daniels. Shaden Sharp might be really good one day. Like, that might be the pick they regret. And he was two picks there, and he hadn't played. It was a little funky. And he fits them better, frankly, than Jaden Ivey, who's small. And they have Cade Cunningham. But, like, Benedict Matherin, Dyson Daniels, Jeremy Sohan, Johnny Davis were the next picks. Like, yeah, Shaden Sharp. Okay, maybe. Maybe. Like, if we're really trying to beg and find a mistake and say they're terrible. And then this year they draft a Seward Thompson who cannot shoot yet at 17% from three. But, I, and we'll see, and he's a great defensive player and he really can't shoot. It's a problem. But like the next guys drafted were Anthony Black, who I can't shoot either. Bilal Kulabai has been a surprise. Therese Walker who really can't shoot. Taylor Hendricks. Casey Wallace. We'll see. Like, I, I don't know that I think they've done that many things wrong. And they've gone 20 and 46, 20 and 52, 23 and 59, 17 and 65, and 2 and 26. That's terrifying. Like, I don't know what you're supposed to do on a rebuild, but I don't want that. And nor does anyone. And it's bad for your franchise and your players and everything they're experiencing. So, yeah, it'd be nice to get the number one pick and all these picks, but, like, they've done it. And they didn't get anything out of it. It's brutal. And I I really look at them and try to go back through their moves. And they trade for Boy. They got a pretty good trade on Boyan for Kelly Olynyk. Maybe Kelly Olynyk would have been a better player for them because he moves the ball and does a bunch of things. But they've actually done things where they've tried to add some veterans to, like, release the burden on their young kids. They got delayed a year by Cade getting hurt. That happens. Yeah, I... And they got uh, Duran, who's really good. The big center he didn't play last night, which makes an impact for them. I, I didn't even include Jalen Duran. He's really good. So it's terrifying to me to look at Detroit. Like, I think you'd have a hard time looking at Detroit and saying, like, Oh, well, they've done these things totally wrong. And that's, thank goodness, that they're Detroit and they're incompetent because that'll never happen to us while we're in a rebuild. Really? Because I got to tell you what, I look at that and I think that could happen to just about anyone. And that's terrifying. 
And Cleveland's done everything right, and they could get it all ripped away from him because Donovan leaves. Because they got a face fracture this year, and then Evan Mobley's got 10 weeks on a knee surgery, and all of a sudden they lose in the playoffs, and Donovan wants out, and then does Darius Garland want out after that, and Evan Mobley wants after that, and then we get great picks, which is great for us, but that's not really their fault. And that story gets nerve-wracking for us. This is hard. Excuse me. Really, really hard. All right, there's a massive offensive explosion going on in the NBA we'll talk about, as well as a... Um, as well as uh, points gained, all coming up here on Locked on Jazz. Today's show is brought to you by our friends over at, uh-oh, sorry, I just had a total brain cramp. Oh, yeah, oh, good. Oh, phew. Yeah, over at Prize Picks. Um, sorry, I just totally cramped. Uh, Prize Picks with the prize picks you can download the uh locked on uh, prize picks app use the promo code locked on and get yourself a uh hundred dollar match guarantee over at prize picks it's daily fantasy sports made easy it's super fun and easy you pick two to six players choose more or less you can mix sports now you get injury uh reboot policy if somebody gets hurt and doesn't play the second half you get rebooted if you want to mix nfl and nba you can do that. It is all easy and fun. So go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA to use the code locked on NBA for your first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. That's prizepicks.com slash locked on NBA to use and use the code locked on NBA for your first deposit match up to a hundred dollars. Prize picks daily fantasy sports made easy. Today's show is also sponsored by BetterHelp. Even the people out there that look like they have the world by the whatevers and in control of everything often are having little internal battles. And those of us that maybe it's more obvious that we're teetering on the edge of having internal battles, talking to someone and having uh, someone you can share your thoughts with to understand what your brain is doing is really really helpful and that's where better help comes in betterhelp.com slash locked on nba will get you off to a great start uh therapy can benefit you from all sorts of different ways you share your experience understand yourself better think of it as a performance enhancing drug for your brain right that's the way to think about therapy it's something to help you understand your brain your thoughts wh- why you're getting into the pitfalls you're getting into what's driving you uh, why is there a reoccurring theme that's taking place? Why are you not as happy as you need to be considering how good your life, anything that it might be? Fill out a brief questionnaire, get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can actually switch therapists at any time at no additional charge, which is really cool. In the season of giving, give to yourself and what you need with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash locked on NBA today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash locked on N-B-A. So this is a little geeky. I don't know if we're going to get to points gained. This is a little geeky. But the offensive rating, according to Cleaning the Glass, in October and November was 114.6, which is really high. Um, And why do I say it's really high? Because in 2022, last year, it was 113.1. And in 2021, which was coming out of COVID, so it's a little funky, is 108.6. So we are 1.5 points higher in 2023 than we were in the same time period of 2022. It's a lot. In December, the offensive rating in the NBA, this is points per 100 possessions, okay? I'm trying to figure out how I can put this into context for you to totally understand. All right. League average, let's do that for a second, just to make sure this all makes total sense. League average offensive rating. We're going to back up 10 years. We're going to do this like for 10 years to make the In 1415, 10 years ago, the offensive rating in the league was a 105.8. That meant that in 100 possessions, the average team in the league would score 105.8 points. So let's jump up. We'll do two-year increments. Two years later, in 16-17, we were at 109.0. Pretty significant jump. Game's changing. 
in 18, 19, two years ahead of that, and then we get a bubble. We get the COVID year. We're going to skip them because they're just weird. We go, we slow down a tiny bit, but we're still on the way up at 110.6. Okay. Then we'll skip COVID and go to 2122, which has a, has a, still has a little COVID in it um, with empty arenas and things like that. And we go to 112.3. So we all kind of wondered, was that related to empty arenas? Was that related to this? So we go to last year. And last year was a 115.1. A ma- a, a, an unbelievable offensive explosion of 115.1. So in a span of 10 years, we're literally scoring 10 points per 100 possessions more than we used to. Like, you've got to, like, blow up everything you think about the game and recalibrate. So the two-year jumps we saw there was a two-year jump of 3.2. Then it slowed down to 1.6, half that. Then it did kind of another 1.6. And then over the COVID jump, it did another three. So a big jump. Okay? So... When in October, November, we were 1.5 points higher than we were last year, it means we are pacing well past 115. Offenses get better as the year goes on. Traditionally, offenses get, if you take the October, November first number, offenses last year got three points, three and a half points per 100 possessions better than they did as the year went on. And the year prior in 2021, where we had a really slow start to the season, so it's kind of a faulty number to look at, but the offense has got five, four or five points better. But generally, offenses, if we actually take December as the benchmark, offenses get as many as, you know, somewhere between about three points per 100 possessions better as the year goes on. Offenses get better. Just That's the way it works. So when we're 114.6 in October, November, and we're 1.5 points above last year's historic 115, you're like, wow. And if we get three points better than that, holy cow. We got three points better in a month. In a month. The league just went from an offensive rating in October, November of 114.6 to 117.7 in a month. It took us two years to jump three points when we looked at this a minute ago. It took us a month to jump three points. We are trending at three points per 100 possessions better than we were a year ago. December last year was 114.7. We're now at 117.7. In 2021, by the way, we're at 111.8. We're six points better per 100 possessions than we were two years ago. This changes like everything you think about the game. This is why offensive rebounding is super important and Will's on top of this. An offensive possession is worth so much. So my turnovers actually maybe as much as I've been talking about, like I don't care that much. Eh, maybe I care. Like not getting a shot up might be way worse than it ever used to be. Last year, from December to January, we jumped 1.5 points. It was a big, massive offensive jump. The, the year before, we jumped 0.8 points. Like it's not unusual. Usually you jump December to January. You actually slow down in February, and then you jump again in March and April. If we do the same jump in 2023 that we did in 2022, in March and April, teams will be averaging 1.2 points per possession. 120 offensive rating will be the league average. It's a crazy concept. Um, and absolutely changes how you look at the game and how you think about players and how you think about positions. It's that mammoth. All right, quickly to points gained. We'll just do a really rough one. We'll do it next week uh, in more detail. Uh, points gained is our offensive metric that judges how many points above a at with the possessions the player uses on a given night, how many points above what an average player um, they would be. So here are the best in the NBA. There's not. There's only one little surprise in here this year, um, or so far. We have our usual four guys above three. We're like right on pacing to what always happens here. For those who've done this with me as an everyday or for a long time, so Joel Embiid is the most impactful offense player in the NBA right now. He's three point nine points 
above league average in the 27 scoring opportunities he uses. Steph Curry's number two at 3.2, which tells you that Golden State's just awful if it wasn't for him. Giannis is 3.1. Kevin Durant is fourth at 2.6. Shea Gilgis Alexander is fifth at 2.5. I mean, those are <clears throat> no surprise here. The stats holding up. Trey Murphy in New Orleans is at 2.4 and having a be- just beginning to explode. Chris Dapps Przingis is at 2.3. Tr- Tyrese Halliburton at 2.2. Obi Topham at 2.2. James Harden at 2.1. Jared Allen at 2.1. Derek White, 2. Kawhi Leonard at 2. Jalen Johnson at 2. Boy, do they miss him. And Daniel Gafford at 2. A quick scan of your Utah Jazz. Points gained. Lowry Markin at 1.8. Kelly Olenek at 1.1. He's so good. Simone is at 0.2, which is good for a guard. Collins at 0.2, which is really good. Walker Kessler at 0.1. And John Collins at minus 0.1. Chris Dunn at minus 0.2. Taylor Hendricks at minus 0.6. Taylor Horton Tucker minus 1.4. Keontae minus 1.7. Jordan Clarkson minus 2.7. All right, that is Locked on Jazz today. Thanks very much for tuning in. Have a very happy holidays and a Merry Christmas. We now send you the first ever 24-7 national sports stream on YouTube. Locked on Sports Today. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy yourself.